Welcome everybody to today's webinar and this morning we were talking about visible and subvisible particulate matter control and the implementation of the USP 1790 staged life cycle approach. Some housekeeping and introduction. Um, myself, I'm Oliver Vallée, I'm the co-founder of RepID and um, yeah, I'm, my background is that I'm a physical chemist and for 17 years I'm uh, now some sort of a particle hunter in the pharmaceutical industry. If you have questions during the webinar, and this is a very interactive webinar, you can use the chat box function, you see that uh, right here. And you just enter your question here. Also, if you, um, well, during the webinar, we will have some polls. So we will ask your opinion or your experience in several fields um, of this matter. And um, your <coughs> participation is very welcome. And it gives also the other attendees some uh, feeling about uh, what's going on in the industry. For those of you who don't know RepID yet, um, we were the manufacturer and then the inventor of morphology directed Raman spect spectroscopy. We have more than 170 instruments in the field and we were the only company that has combined Raman and LIBS for the identification of particles in one instrument. The layer explorer is another technique that has not uh, just indirectly something to do with the um, <coughs> control of particles, but it's controlling the lubrication in prefillable syringes and cartridges. And then we provide since 2005 um, contract testing services and we have been audited by the US FDA. So we were working under GMP, we had no objections. We serve more than 600 customers worldwide and we do mainly industrial forensic, which is root cause investigation, but we also provide um, method development and validation as well as compendial methods such as USP 788, method one and method two and um, we were the <coughs> let's say a one-stop agency for all kinds of particle issues because this is so popular and particles became so popular and you will see very soon why we have since four years now a subsidiary in new jersey and today i'm here in the headquarters in berlin where we have the r d in manufacturing and um, also the very important, from my opinion, application support that um, is also provided from um, the US side for all the Americas. We provide training courses on um, the USP 1790 life cycle, and we were very proud to do this together with Roy Cheris. He is one of the co-authors of the 1790 and we already had five workshops in a, together in New Jersey. We started this series in 2014. And if you have colleagues in the US uh, that want to um, attend, that's the link for the registration. In Europe, we also provide training courses uh, together with the Parenteral Drug Association, the PDA. The next one is in September in combination with particle identification in parenterals or injectables this time, yeah. And that's a, a Berlin conference. And um, yeah, we, we walk you through all the stages of the life cycle and give you the <coughs> background in theory, but also in uh, really hands-on with the particles, as you see it here. Uh, that's a picture from our lab in Germany. And I guess it's now time for the first poll. So the question is, um, what methods do you currently use for particulate matter identification? Check all that apply. They are melting point and um, Pyrolysis, polarized light microscopy, 
light induced breakdown spectroscopy, molecular spectroscopy, um, and atomic analysis. And so it looks like molecular spectroscopy um, is the most popular answer. Yeah, it also seems that we have really some experts here in that field, and I'm very happy. So, um, because I skipped some the explanation about what spectroscopy is and so on, and um, that's uh, so I did I did good. <laughs> yeah, motivation and regulatory, and maybe we first talk about the motivation. Um, Visual inspection, um, well, it all was stirred up by this uh, sentence, essentially free of visible particles. And particles, we all know that, um, are partially unavoidable. So there will be, uh, there will be always particles. And uh, from that, the motivation was to make uh, some sort of a guideline, a scientific-based approach on controlling them. And one part is of this 1790 is what we will be talking about today. And the chapter or the subchapter of the 1790 is this inspection life cycle and the continuous improvement. So we will focus on this today, the, just when you like to find that in the book. And you will find that officially released, uh, that means it, it is effective then in August 27. And um, yeah, the, when we look back the last couple of years, or that means when we started with RepID, that was in um, before 2002, uh, so there was nearly no recalls for particulate matter. And when I made a survey in 2000, um, most of the people I called personally said, well, how, I asked them, how often do you make investigations and uh, do you carry out root cause investigations? And they said, yeah, maybe two, three times a year. And this has changed somewhat in 2010, when you see a quick jump from three recalls to 19 recalls. And um, it hit some kind of peak year was 2014 with 41 recalls for foreign particulate matter in parenteral drugs. What were the observations that the inspectors of the FDA had? So the so-called for, Form 483 and um, just about root cause particle characterization. There was the investigation regarding the metal particulate contamination in lots was inadequate. There was no investigation conducted to determine the cause of the black metal particles found in these lots. Mm and so on and so on. So it's very often it's about the investigation, uh, the lack of adequate procedures to investigate and implement corrective actions. Particles, just um, very briefly about particle size and what is visible and what is subvisible. I don't talk about uh, Jules Snap uh, limits and the gray zone. Um, Today, to make it simpler, a particle above 100 micron is considered to be visible. And then there's also some part of this updated uh, USP. There were categories now. And it's not only in the 1790, it's also in, in other, when we talk about subvisible particulate matter, the 1788, for example. Um, there were different categories of particles. And maybe before we ask that, we might have the poll number three now. What is the majority of particles found in parentals? Glass, cellulose, silicone, plastic or metal? So the results show that cellulose was the most popular answer, with 75% of you choosing that one. Silicone second with 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, thank you again for your active contribution. And also, um, you were right. It's um, the cellulose is number one. And sometimes when you do um, investigations, the silicon uh, is masking um, or other parts. Silicon oil is very strong in molecular spectroscopy, especially when you use an IR. So very often the silicon could even mask a cellulose signal. And uh, so that's why they were both um, so much in the lead, but very, very good. So now that we come to these categories, and I think um, since you were really expert, you already know what extrinsic is. And ext extrinsic means it's really uh, out of control. Um, that means from the criticality level, that is very uh, considered to be very high. Um, worst case is, of course, parts of insects, uh, but also some gowning materials, um, skin flakes um, and, and, and flakes of uh, paint chips that would be considered to be extrinsic. And of course, uh, a lack of control, but also a possible breach of sterility. Intric intrinsic uh, particles is yeah things you would expect. Parts of the primary packaging and um, also some API or excipient particles. Now, with that knowledge that we have the, the cellulose as the number one source of particulate matter, is this now extrinsic or intrinsic? So here I'm really a little bit... Hmm, um, because very often the cellulose travels with the stoppers. So um, since it comes from that direction, it could be considered intrinsic. But of course, it's uh, something that it's not, you know, um, yeah, very likely to be there. Or, well, it's likely to be there because it's the number one. But here I struggle a little bit with these definitions. Inherent, um, this is um, mostly API particles that are um, in, in the large molecules, protein-based formulations, when they form aggregates, and then they were considered to be inherent particles. And um, yeah, let's think about the silicon number two. Um, where is that in the game? Is that inherent or is it intrinsic? But now let's go back to uh, the 7090 scope. So the scope is that you um, have a, you look into, or you find visible particles in field sealed containers, and you um, check the visible defects. That not what we, that's not what we talk about today, like container integrity. But then uh, you also look for um, particulate matter. And for this, you do mostly manual inspection. What Roy has called remediation and prevention is uh, the starting point of this inspection life cycle. And uh, most of what I will talk today is a focus on that. Because the second part is just application to this um, staged approach of con um, on looking for this particulate matter into different points in the life cycle of the product or into uh, critical quality aspects that you have in your production. And yeah, as we already seen, uh, common sources of intrinsic particles is the formulation, packaging components, processing. The long term goal is that you establish alert and action levels, and you can only do that properly when you have periodic review and update. So a typical process flow for the 7090 is that you have the filling and after the filling you do a 100% inspection. And the, the part what we were talking about happens after 100% inspection. And we were today, oops, just talking about the, this part. Analyze and trend rejects. I will not talk, and that's maybe another section when we talk about supplemental testing or uh, when we go deeper into IQ, sam IQL sampling and testing. So that's the, the portion we, we will look at today and focus on. 
This is a slide I got from Roy. And when you um, look into this sampling and in initial monitoring, that's uh, when you have the shoebox of rejects and you look into that. And uh, from that, you can uh, develop a short-term historical profile. That simply means you have different categories of particles that you find. And then you start identifying those particulate sources. Then you can develop initial alert levels and then it's ongoing. That means you optimize the process relating to the particles that you found and the sources that you have identified. And then you go on with that monitoring and training. And after you have evaluated and established alert levels, you can then um, have action levels that would trigger action in certain areas of um, your critical quality aspects. How does, uh, well, in, in other terms, how do we do that? So we have these visual inspection particle rejects. And after an initial characterization, we have the question, is it extrinsic biological source? So it's the most critical defect you can have as a particle. And these are just two types. It's insect parts or hair. And if it's that, you really have to start the investigation right away. If it's not that biological source, it's still a major, so all other defects, and then um, you just need to know if the particle is a typical one. Then uh, the next question, if, if you have exceeded your limits, and if not, yeah, you just train the data and go on. But if you have exceeded limits or if, you, if that particle is not a typical one, you will start an investigation. You do some risk assessment where you look at uh, you know, how big is the risk and then you might even trigger a reinspection of the entire lot. And that's just an overview. And today I will go into two points of this, but these are all parts of your processes and production where you could look into and where you could frequently check the quality in respect of particulate matter. And that keeps you um, yeah, in, in good control over these critical quality aspects. For example, when you look at customer complaints, and uh, feed that into your system. When you look at stability and retention samples from time to time, then you would see if over time something happens in your product. And um, yeah, all the other parts, I have a few examples for that, but before we do that, I will give you an introductory over the staged approach of um, the, the particle control. In a different view, you see that here. And again, we have the visual inspection here. We have the rejects, and that's where we started. We have this loop here. And um, after the classification of an and trending, that means after uh, the level one check of uh, the particulate matter, you can trigger investigations and create and update a defect library. So. Defect library is really a starting point that you need when you implement the 7090 life cycle because it's something that uh, you can use to train your inspectors and it's also of course the basis for classification and trending. So for this Subchapter of the 7019, a summary is that particle characterization is needed for the training and inspection of uh, and inspection results. It's a basis and uh, it might help when you do a risk assessment. It helps you a lot when you start investigations, um, when you exceed limits, because then you might um, have some action before you actually run into trouble <clears throat> so you can avoid um, recalls with that of course and customer complaints 
And with um, a continuous root cause investigation, you could get rid of your particle sources and um, in, in establish an, a nice and good quality product. So I think it's time for um, the next poll. So um, what kind, what type of particles do you usually deal with? Um, take all that apply. Organic particles, inorganic particles, metallic particles, or glass particles. So it looks like a lot of you, um, or ninety percent of you, deal with organic particles. Yes, and that matches, of course, the the first poll when we were talking about the um, cellulose as the majority and the silicon oil, of course. Now, I will give you a very quick overview and then we go into details about uh, what is this defect typing and what is the level one, uh, two and level three uh, definition here. In a nutshell, uh, you start with the black and white background and you have an operator there that is able to define um, or type a particle category with some tools. Uh, but it's all happening, level one is happening in the closed bottle. That means you don't open the container and um, you can define certain categories such as glass, fiber, light, dark, color. The big advantage of this is that the container integrity is still intact, so cross-contamination is not possible, and it's very fast compared to the other methods. And you even have tools nowadays, and I will go into details with that, that document the particulate matter, and you can feed that information into a database or compare it with the defect library. So uh, level one, leads to pictures that you can show to inspectors that you can use as a basis for training and it's very fast. Next level is then the isolation. So you take the particles out and then you have them ready for all kinds of investigations. You can use IR, ATR, Raman, LIPS, SEM, EDS. Then you have them on the filter, have them isolated and put them in. So that was just a brief introductory and the overview. And now um, we go into the details of this level one, two, three. Level one is the visual observation. And it's, again, it's very important that you don't confuse this with visual inspection. This is after visual inspection. So it's following the 100% visual inspection that's already done. We use similar tools here. And when we train this, and that's a picture from the training course, we have a sheet that our um, attendee or the, the, the um, attendees of the training course are working with. So when they make an observation, they say, okay, the particle is floating, so it's in the solution. Then they swirl it and look uh, at the buoyancy. Does it go up? Is it neutral? Does it sink? Yeah. And then they might be able to see the shape and they might be able to do this with other tools, like the um, an inverted microscope and or um, yeah the and with that you can uh, select well it's a compact one and you might be able to see the color mm -hmm. and you can even say well this is maybe a glass suspect or something else so that's the basic level one visible characterization part and then you're done so you need about one to five minutes to fill out that sheet and to find the particles with some proper training. When it becomes a little bit more sophisticated, then uh, you can use this inverted microscope and 
I will have a few examples here. And um, yeah, we had a question, but I'm, I'm not so sure if that's that issue is solved. Anyway, I I go on and hope that we can work on that. So when we now use better tools or more sophisticated tools, you can use an inverted microscope here, for example. You can use video microscopes to take pictures and with that you can get uh, really good results of particles, images. So at level one you can take that picture and here we have a 400 micrometer long particle, a little bit flaky, more or less transparent. You see the outline and the shape. I took off the colors here because um, that did not uh, really help in those pictures. But you can um, see the shape very good. Uh, you can see if it's translucent because the light comes from underneath. So it's, uh, it's in transmission. Uh, you, you have the shape, it's chip-like. So you already have a good idea about what, what you see there in your packaging. That is, um, well, I guess it's a glass particle, so that's a, a very good uh, example for a glass-like particle. It's transparent and it's fast sinking. This is very neutral and floating, maybe some plastic material. And here you see something that's shining and uh, shining and glittering. And so that's a, a typical example for a metal part. So with this level one and with some tools, you have a very good and fast toolbox to quickly sort particles into these defect types. And that's a very straight fiber. Okay, before we now start with level two, maybe one more poll. How long do you wait for particle ID results? Um, four hours, four days, two weeks, or four weeks? So it looks like a lot of you don't really wait that much longer at all. Um, four days uh, is the most popular answer, then two weeks, four hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it shows that um, yeah, seventy-five percent of you have access to uh, in-house laboratories. I guess where you have um, yeah, quick response time and a good trained team that is able to give you these answers very quickly. And uh, about a, a quarter of you uh, waits longer than two weeks. Uh, Ten percent even longer than four weeks, which is um, well. Some customers told me that. Um, yeah, I wait so long for those results. Well, the problem is gone when I uh, have the, the the answer. And um, yeah, with this with this uh, stage approach and the level one, that's something you can do and establish very close to production. And you have a quick defect typing um, answer or let's say uh, control. And um, so that, that uh, at least gives you some um, good reason on, on testing stuff when it's an atypical particle, for example, that you have never seen before. And um, it, it, to one extent, it, it might minimize your, um, the amount of samples that you measure. But on the other hand, uh, if you have something atypical, you should have really access to a lab uh, that gives you quick uh, return times in uh, terms of um, identification results. Something intermediate could be the level two. And level two is also something that you can establish and it requires some, um, some more tools than of course level one. Mm, and it's uh, the integral part is that you now remove the particle from uh, the bottle. And the, the utmost priority in doing this is that you keep um, yeah, other contaminants from uh, the one that you have want to isolate. Uh, 
And that's why you go into a clean bench. Uh, that's a controlled environment where you have good control over uh, the yeah the uh, some some contaminants but you also uh, need to be careful a little bit with the wind in that clean bench um, because very often uh, you see that um, particles could fly away in the wind so that's uh, one thing you should consider and then there were different tools that you could use capillaries um, tips to fish the particles out we call them the fishing tools um, more common here in our laboratory is that we um, use filters. And when you would like to do spectroscopy afterwards, you could use these gold-coated microscope slides and, um, and or the gold-coated filters from us, the filtrate membrane. All in all, it's good when you have a smooth metal surface. Uh, metal because, um, and the majority of the particles is organic, uh, with the molecular spectroscopy, IR and Raman, metals don't give signals and so you get good results on those surfaces. The filtrate, filtrate membrane, you saw it already, is a simple vacuum filtration. You can also use other means of membranes to isolate a particle, for example, um, cellulose nitrate also works very good and then you funnel the content of the bottle onto a filter or you um, use a pipette and put it from the pipette onto the filter. We use all kinds of these techniques here to isolate particles depending on the formulation. Very important is then that you do, um, well, in our case, we do an immediate microscopy in the clean bench. So that we have already a picture before we take it out of the clean bench. And then we move on and go maybe to more sophisticated microscopes. Calibration for sizing. Uh, I think that's uh, very clear. In a, such a highly regulated industry, you always need um, traceable certificated uh, certificates and, and standards and then you can start really um, analyze the size and the shape of particles and of course document whatever you found Now we come to level three and um, maybe it's a, it's very good to ask now the poll number two. How often do you identify particles by means of spectroscopy? One day three times per year, 10 times per year, 50 investigations of more than 100. So it looks like, um, most of you do about 50 investigations or more than 100 um, per year. Yeah, I'm impressed. Um, I'm, I'm really impressed. And that clearly shows us that we no longer are in 2001, but we were now heading 2020, uh, 2020, I mean. And um, yeah, these are different times when it comes to uh, particulate matter. Now the level three, the so-called level three is exactly what you were doing, uh, some of you very frequently. It's this spectroscopic investigation and as we have already learned, most of you are using molecular spectroscopy, FTIR and Raman. And I won't go into the details of that techniques, I do this in other webinars. So you can, level three considers all these types of investigation tools that gives you um, that that goes down to the molecular and atomic level in this uh, investigation. The ultimate goal is that you connect the particle with the source, and that means that you have a good control over the sources. And I will show you uh, later on an example about how you can test stoppers. Um, but we will now focus on a few examples of uh, these investigations. Um, I've already said that we cover with LIBS and EDS the metals and the inorganic parts. 
and the organics are covered by Raman and IR spectroscopy and the inorganics are some, somewhat in, in the middle and sometimes even organic materials have, have inorganic filling materials so plastic very often comes with inorganic fillers, stumpers have inorganic filling materials some colors and dyes are also inorganic so very often it's, it's good to cover both in the investigation. Mm, these are also pictures from the workshop. So we have the IR on the left hand side uh, that is also equipped with an ATR. We use uh, SEM mm, EDS analysis as well. And we have our own invention which is the Raman Lips combination. That the uh, beauty of that instrument is that it's very fast. So uh, with a push button operation you change from Raman to Lips and you stay on the microparticles because from our experience the longest time that you spend in, spectro or in micro spectroscopy is find and locate the particle. That is what this instrument is doing automatically and then uh, change from one to the other investigation a tool that means uh, changing from lips to Raman is really uh, fast quick and efficient and uh, so the sample loss or the particle loss is minimized in that operation. Just a few examples for those of you who are not so familiar with uh, the LIBS. LIBS is an emission technique. It's based on um, the on a, it's a laser based technique La LIBS stands for laser induced breakdown spectroscopy and with this emission we can um, fingerprint particle uh, materials such as silicon aluminum also the lighter element as so, uh, elements as sodium and carbon We're very very good and that makes it very powerful for glass but we come to this later raman um, Similar to IR and ATR, it, it's giving you fingerprint spectra of the, in this example, of a mixture between polyester and, and uh, some pigments, the titanium dioxide pigments. And on the right hand side, you see the, the same particles emission spectra, which shows you a little bit of titanium and carbon and copper, um, which comes from the dye. So that's a good example for a combination of inorganic and organic materials. Very common, even in stainless steel, 316 production is rust. And you can then uh, see with the naked eye more or less uh, the red color, but also the red, red iron oxide with the Raman. And with the LIBS you see ion emission. On the other hand, the stainless steel, when it's not rusty, uh, gives you a flat line with the Raman and uh, the Lips steel emission. Yeah. And now let's go to some USP 1790 examples, where we do first the in-situ documentation and well, I, I named them example. It's more or less the basis, and we do this for um, several customers here, uh, is that we build the defect library or start building the defect library and train the customers in populating it. And that's the more or less the workflow that we that we do. It's we take images in the closed container, we do a filtration then and then we apply all the tools we have to have all the spectroscopic information on those particles. And the hair suspect here that we have in level one and two, so that's in the bottle. It was a plastic container, so it's a little bit opaque. The same hair suspect now on the filter and then we use the IR and in this case the ATR and the Raman to get those spectra. ATR is usually the last thing you do to a particle. Uh, you might know that because the ATR is a contact method and it's very likely that the particle is A destroyed or B lost after this operation. Here we have a stopper suspect the stopper in the inverted microscope on the left hand side 
has a size of uh, roughly um, 600 micrometers and when you take a closer look you see on the outline uh, those particle properties like it's not very defined now surprise the particle is red uh, you might see that uh, well the operator has might might, might saw uh, see that already but in the inverted microscope you don't see colors that good uh, but now when it's on the filter you clearly see it's it's length it's really 600 micrometer and it's reddish now with the raman we are seeing silicon with an extra peak and that extra peak is probably the red color when we hit it with the lips we see a bit, little bit of sodium silicon and iron and the iron is then confirmed with the EDS so that is a full entry in um, the defect library fully categorized you see it from the in situ images to SEM analyzes Another one is the glass. Glass in the closed container on the left hand side, then on the microscope, and then uh, in the uh, single particle explorer scan. Size is about 1.2 micro uh, millimeter. And that's the Raman and the lips. I guess now it's time for the next poll. Have you ever implemented the USP 1790 life cycle approach to inspect defect types and classifications? Yes or no? It looks like um, the USP life cycle is pretty new to um, a lot of you, 63%, whereas 37% of you said yes. What I'd like to give you now is one more example of, um, or let's say I have two, but we were maybe a little bit late but for those of you who would like to stay longer um, I have two examples one is from a filling and in process testing however in this case the uh, the trigger of the investigation was not in a life cycle is what is it was a typical root cause investigation but we can now apply what we have learned about uh, the life cycle onto this example and the second example I have is um, supplier quality testing is when we look into stoppers. Now, our cellulose source case, and that uh, was a case that we investigated a couple of years ago. In this example, four batches failed in a row. And three samples of each batches, what we, we looked into, so we established what you can now say, a short-term particle profile for that product. And then we try to find out where the problem really comes from. But it was very, very soon clear that cellulose, or cellulose played a big role in that. And in this case, the cellulose gave us some um, really advantage. or it, 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 um, it was like a gift because in this case, the cellulose had an extra peak. So the majority of that cellulose uh, had, it, had the extra peak and we knew where to look at. So we had to find cellulose and cellulose, as you might know, has a broad peak at 1100, but this one had also another peak at 1600 wave numbers. We got samples from the filling and they were taken before tube rinse, um, before cleaning in place and after, and we also looked into stoppers. So everything that is really related to filling, fill and finish of that product. The stopper gave some particles. Um, we, you see some particles here before and after tubing rinse and um, also before and after CIP. Then we build the library and we the customer sent us all materials that are somehow cellulose related. These were the autoclavation bags, this was some paper, there were some socks, t-shirts, towel, paper, everything that was used in that filling um, environment or uh, in the filling plant where cellulose was there. And yeah, none of it had this extra peak at 1600. 
So, um, yeah, when we looked into the tube rinse results, we found 19 particles of cellulose larger than 100, but they were all matched with the uh, AC bag, autoclavation bag, the inside of that. Hmm. Mm, we had also a few from the blue bag, but not the contaminant. So we went a little bit further upstream in this case and where we found the contaminants in, uh, in the majority, the cellulose contaminant was in the production site in Italy. And uh, these were the tank samples, the tank rinse samples that we looked at. And here we were uh, finding large numbers of those particles. And they were huge. And we also found the root cause. It was a, a paper towel that they used to wipe down that tank. So what tells us this example? When we apply now the 7090 is that, well, when we, or when this customer uh, uh, would have made its homework, uh, it would be very soon in uh, building a defect library clear where that is coming from and without failing a single batch they might have um, stopped this uh, tower from being part of the manufacturing process of the API. Now, the, not very often it is that cellulose gives us the favor to have an extra peak, but in this example it was the case. And sometimes uh, you can even use um, sophisticated database tools to different and, and multi-component data analysis in order to differentiate cellulose from different sources. Now, the, the last example I have, and also short to conclude this talk, is the ISO 8871. And here, that's uh, when I cite uh, Roy. He, mm, I, will, I will look into this part three. That means the determination of the release particle count. And, uh, yep. Yeah. Typically, you take out a number of stoppers, you put them into a water tween solvent, swirl this for some time, and then uh, you take a look at the particles that you have there. So this could be a bag of um, stoppers. In this case, there were pistons or plungers that are used in pre-filled syringes. And when you look at the filter, filter looks like that. So um, we took out a couple of stoppers and you see the, the bright particles here. They are recognized by the instrument sized. Magnification here is 200 times. The diameter is 13.5. It takes about 11 minutes to scan and count all those particles. And what you find is 41 particles larger than 50 microns from 25 stoppers. Hmm. Now, when you calculate this back to the surface area, 25 stoppers have a surface area of 58 centimeters. So per 10 centimeters of surface, you still have seven visible particles and 25, uh, several particles larger than 50 and 25 stoppers. And in this example, we also compared different counting methods because counting is not counting. And you can use different means of counting. You can count manually with the 788 method or you use um, these gold-coded filters. And very often we were asked, well, why do you count more with those filters? The reason is because the contrast for transparent and semi-transparent uh, particles is much higher in the uh, dark field mode on the gold filter than it is uh, with nitrocellulose filters in the bright field mode. And you can clearly say, just um, for those of you who use the single particle explorer uh, to control those, that it's about 
50 percent uh, about 100 percent more that you find on the dark field mode on uh, the shiny surface compared to the whitish surface and um, yeah that's a, a good evidence when you like to have a, a very um, critical control tool in looking into stopper quality last but not least we also found something like this and what do you think this where where this come from it came from the bag itself so it's, sometimes it's very good to not only look into stoppers but check the bag quality and test the bag and then you have a very good feeling maybe even a better feeling than looking at stoppers in what's going on in that stopper bag So I'd like to conclude this webinar today with a um, citation from, from Roy and uh, that's, that's really a summary. The, if you would like to gain particulate matter control, use a scientific approach. Um, there is a book um, available in the PDA bookstore. It's called Visual Inspection and Particulate Control from Scott Aldrich, Roy Cheris and John Shabushnik. Uh, all three of them have yeah, combined 100 years of experience in dealing with uh, particulate matter in parenteral drug production. And yeah, I can just encourage you maybe take a look into this book and apply some of those methods and um, it will help you to increase quality and uh, yield and gives you better control over your production. Thank you very much. Have you found this webinar very useful? Yes or no? So resounding yes there. Wow, that's a great vote. <laughs> Thank you very much. And if you have some questions, please, um, we can um, stay here and, and you can please feel free to use the chat function to ask some further questions.